Mishka Shabali is catching up with friends who are arguably more talented than him. Ahoy, hoy. Um, hey, what's up, gang? I am back from Altercation Comedy Festival, which it's really funny. The my everything's really funny. When I was gone, my mom uh, painted the inside of the trailer in my backyard, which is accommodation for wandering comedians. And she did a careful like Instagram post where she carefully said, "You know, my son was away at Altercation Comedy Festival," which I think is uh, is really cute. The you nailed the branding, mom. Um, also, my mom does not have cancer. Man, that that is a that is a real good feeling. The she does. Um, I'm going to podcast with her tomorrow. I think she does have a mass in her throat that she will have to have removed, and it will be an involved operation and an involved recovery. Uh, but it's not cancer, and that means that everything is uh, everything is negotiable. Um, I feel good, which is really weird. Uh, I mean, I feel elated that my mom doesn't have cancer that I feel like I'm rubbing it in now. Um, yeah, sorry. The, um, but I had, uh, I had such a good time at altercation. So fucking fun. So funny. It's just the, one of the best things is, you know, discovering sort of like massive talents like, uh, James Adomian who I had no idea who he was or what what he did. And just like, wow, I have a new favorite comedian. This guy is a fucking uh, a box of light bulbs. I mean, he's just uh, just so fucking hilarious. And the, it's sort of like four radios going on at the same time, and every one of those radios is the funniest fucking thing you've ever heard. Just uh, ruthless, ceaseless... Fat, fast forward punchline after punchline after punchline until I was just sort of howling. And one of the best things about him too is that his jokes crack him up. The, he was like fighting to keep it together at some points. And, you know, people shit on Burt Kreischer and say, oh, he laughs at his own jokes. The, if you, motherfucker, if you can't make yourself laugh, if you don't think you're funny, if, if the shit doesn't tickle your funny bone, you're not going to make us laugh at it. Like, I hope you think your jokes are funny. The, um, I hope they crack you up every time. Um, that was just incredibly life affirming. The Heels CD release show that was just incredible. Um, it's that record is like um, the new record from my four favorite bands. You know, they sort of hit uh, like Rights of Spring and then sort of more like straight up hardcore stuff and the sort of power pop that I love that they do. And it it sounds like my four favorite bands, and it also sounds exactly like Heels. Uh, just, just oh, so good. And uh, Kyle Pogue, my road wife, killed so many great comics. Uh, Sam Miller, I had no idea who that guy was. So fucking funny. Sari Beliak, uh, my grief buddy here in Phoenix, she destroyed. I'm just, I'm like exhausted. I was like choking back tears in the Austin airport because I felt so fucking good. Um, anywho. Uh, coming up uh, today, podcast with uh, Brandy Posey. She will be doing a house at my show. At, or a, she'll be doing a house at my show. She'll be doing a show at my house uh, this November. Uh, let me see what day she's doing the because I'm dumb. Um, she will be doing it on uh, Wednesday, November 9th. Uh, it's a school night, so we'll be starting early at 7 p.m. Uh, we've got uh, John Michael Bond is traveling with her, Anna Valenzuela. Uh, Sari Beliak will be on the show, my friend Leslie Barton. How have I not had her on the podcast? She's fucking great. Um, I didn't know Brandy at all. Uh, we have uh, you know a bunch of mutual friends, and JT Habersat is a great uh, sort of bullshit filter. And... <laughs> It was so interesting to sort of get into the meat of the podcast and find out that um, she's not a mama's boy like me. She lost her mom, uh, which is a, a grief I cannot imagine and I hope I never encounter. And also, uh, she was straight edge. She's never drank or done drugs. Um, and for having absolutely nothing in common, boy, we sure had a lot to talk about. Um, really can't wait to have her here 
and just, uh, I don't know, continue the conversation. She's so, so funny, so sharp, so open. Um, and so many local comics here just couldn't wait to get on that show. So, uh, please sign up for the Patreon. That's one of the ways I sort of keep all these projects rolling. It's patreon.com slash Mishka Shivali. And please come to the house show here at, at Mikasa, uh, 1902 West Palm Lane in Phoenix, 7 p.m. on November 9th. And enjoy the conversation with Brandy Posey. Brandy Posey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to it's good to uh, talk to you and see you. Love it's, your velvet paintings. It's I, the, I know you, you like my carefully cultivated backdrop of uh, garage sale hoarder behind me. Mm, the, you should see the rest of this house. Uh, yeah, it's my aesthetic as well. I get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm constantly being roasted for it. The um yeah we uh this is gonna be a fun and funny one because we don't know each other at all. Um the we. All I know is that uh, you're doing altercation this mm-hmm. fall, which I have found to be a uh, a pretty foolproof bullshit filter. Yeah. If if you're doing altercation, you're probably <laughs> really smart, really funny, not a creep, and we're gonna be friends. And the um and on that alone, uh, you and Anna Valenzuela are coming to uh, to play my house in November. Yeah, no, exa- exactly, which I'm stoked for. I mean, yeah, I think it's funny because it's like there's there's a few of our us like kind of DIY fun comics that like we just play the same places different weekends often. It's like I met JT Habersat like three years ago, October 2019 was the first time, but we'd known each other's names forever. And then we both like did this house party in Jacksonville like the day before Fest. And we're both like setting up our little merch. And I was just like, hey, it's like nice to meet you finally. I've seen your I've seen your face on posters all over this country. <laughs> it's nice to see you. <laughs> and now we're it, homies. It, it's such a funny thing that we do because it is a um it is kind of a solitary thing by nature in that mm-hmm. um you're working on uh on your stuff, on your bits, your writing, your um you're doing shows, you're, you're producing, you're doing your podcast or whatever the, but then also we we're always sort of passing by uh, other comics who are sort of migrating in the same circles, playing the same clubs. The, yeah. I, I, I mean, I ran into the same thing in the early two thousands with like indie rock bands where totally. we would like leave each other notes on our posters and stuff like that. <laughs> and some of those people have, you know, wound up being um, people I then actually met in real life years later. And now like we became friends and exchanged Christmas cards in our forties and weird shit yeah. like that. So it's fun getting older and getting to do corny shit, right? It's like kind of nice to have given yourself the permission later in life to be like, oh, yeah, Christmas cards are nice, actually. <laughs> I, I was thinking about that, that like, um, I feel like the definition of becoming an adult is just that uh, everything that you hated as a child will suddenly become amazing to you. Like, I, yes. I just went and got lunch with a friend and I had Brussels sprouts and I was like, oh, these are delicious. And as a child, I would have been like, this is fucking bullshit, mom. Like, this is a hate crime. What are you doing? You know, and then and then today yeah. I was like, maybe I'll go to bed real early tonight. Oh, <laughs> it's nice. It's nice. It's it's almost like an erotic thrill, like when you know when when you're a kid and your like parents you know uh, say yeah we can get dessert tonight from Friendlies or wherever the fuck you know. Totally, totally, but, yeah. It makes me understand my parents more the older I get. Where I'm like, oh yeah, you weren't lame and you were tired. I think is what happens. <laughs> that, that needs to, wow, uh, abusive or just tired? Yeah, like a game show for your parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the my it's funny my mom still lives uh she lives down the street she lives four or five houses down the Aww, you'll meet her nice. when you're here because she comes to all the shows nice. the, the last show that we did uh a, my friend uh critical miss who does sort of uh an acoustic like riot girl thing um she covered a cannibal corpse song in a sort of a slow romantic fashion and it was uh like about just fisting and all sorts of horrible <laughs> stuff and my mom yeah. is sort of right there in the front row slapping her leg and i was Aww. like i 
It's going to take me a while to unpack this. <laughs> <laughs> but also what a great relationship to have. I mean, like, you know, the one way or the other. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 and again, you know, something that, you know, the, I imagine the 13 year old Brandy, 15 year old Brandy being like the living down the street from your mom, yeah. it's, that's fucking bullshit, you know, the, mm -hmm. but yeah, I love it. So we have coffee together sometimes. It's, Aww. uh, yeah, it's amazing. The, um, so you are, you're going to be on the road going down to mm -hmm. altercation and then coming back the, and you're in LA right now. Yeah, yeah. I live in I live in LA. I've been here for like 15 years. I'm like originally from Baltimore. I like uh, went to college in Philly, but then I moved out to LA afterwards because at that point in my life, it was like 06. And I was like, well, you either have to move to New York or LA is like what I had thought. I know that's not to be the case now, but like, whatever, I was already here. And I didn't like New York very much. So I think I was like too Southern to deal with a lot of its shit. <laughs> I like visiting it now and it's fun, but then I'm always like ready, like, okay, Everyone could just be a little bit more polite and I'd be okay. <laughs> I, it's, I mean, I did a similar thing, you know, when I was 21, it was New York or LA. And I think yeah. the only reason that I moved, that I cho chose New York over LA is because I was a drunk and I was like, mm. well, if I lived in LA, I would never be able to get around or I'd just immediately get a DUI. And you can live happily as a drunk in New York yeah, totally for, can. for years and years and years. And that's what I did. Yeah. Well, interesting. So that's, that's funny because like, so a thing you, you don't know me, so you probably don't know this. I am, I technically it's straight edge, but it is like, I'm 38. So who the fuck calls themselves straight edge at 38 losers? Like I just don't drink and I just never did drugs. Like that's kind of how I feel. <laughs> Okay, the, the the only tragic thing about what you just said is that this is going to be audio only, so people won't see the six-second eye roll you did before you said the word straight edge. Yeah. Because that was, that was tremendous. The, I was like, the man, there must be a fly in the room or something that she's about to try and catch. Like, the, she, is it going to be like a frog thing? Her tongue's going to come right out? Yeah, or the yeah. cat thing? The, so you're... Um, uh, you were straight edge or you are you've I never am. done you've never done anything yeah. ever mm -hmm. well, uh, caffeine yeah. cigarettes uh caffeine no uh caffeine yes cigarettes no um i don't have like the rules around like no sex or anything like that but it's mostly just like drinking and drugs i was like don't fuck with it I, I i know i have an addictive personality i always say that i feel like in a previous life i must have overdosed on something stupid because in this time i was like let's not find something that we like more than sugar and I think at like an early age, I was, I just was like, let's not, cause I have, I have addicts in my family and I just didn't want to be like them basically. And then, you know, I went to school in Philly and like, um, my, my friends growing up didn't drink really. We were just suburban kids who played jackass all the time. And then when, in, in, when I went to college, people were so aggro about it that I'm mm -hmm. a contrarian to my core. And I was like, fuck that. That's the only period of time that I was ever like remotely militant about it because I was like, fuck you guys, X's on my hands at shows and shit like that just to piss people off. And then I moved to LA and I was like a broke comedian who had to drive everywhere. So I just never, it never drinking specifically just never seemed like a, um, a thing that made sense. And then everything's expensive and now I'm 38 and I can talk to people. So I'm good. It's kind of it's kind of how this is so fucking fascinating to me. Yeah, the I I I've addicted myself to every single fucking thing I could find, and yeah, every yeah. time I talk to I meet somebody who has been um, addicted to something that I've never done. I'm part of me, like the weird like lizard brain is just sort of like tell me more about this horrific <laughs> experience you had so that I can the wow that is why my um allow me to uh, assume the role of uh, alcoholic splinter here yeah, and yeah. um and give you some of the life advice you uh, absolutely don't need which <laughs> would be please continue to not start drinking yeah. holy shit what um, I'm, now I'm just thinking about like what I could have done in my life if I had not <laughs> devoted most of it to doing nothing. Uh -huh. Well, not nothing. These are all the things that needed to happen to get you to where you're at now. And, you know, we all have our, we all have our different shit. I mean, you know, we all have our different shit and different paths and everything. I mean, I'm, you know, I get it. It's, 
Well, we're, we are not going to run out of shit to talk about. I already have like four, <laughs> 40 questions in my head. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. One, <laughs> one is that the, um, it's so interesting to me that you reference sugar right mm-hmm. away, where you are like, I don't need something stronger or worse than this. Yeah. The, were you a sugar freak when you were a kid? Oh, me and my dad each had our own Hershey syrup bob- bottles labeled at all times. And I could just like fucking freebase it, baby. <laughs> I wow. mean, I, yeah, I, I'm a chocolate sugar maniac. I mean, I what I've learned later in life, I'm on Wellbutrin for depression. That when I started taking antidepressants, it changed almost immediately overnight. My like my like I, my brain needed dopamine extremely badly. And I was chasing that and I did not realize how it, I'd be so frustrated for a long time. Like I have no fucking willpower. I can, I can force myself to do so much shit. Why can't I like stay away from this? And then when I started, when I chemically balanced my brain correctly, it was like, Oh, you were just like trying to fix this problem in yourself for so long. And it wasn't like, I'd be white knuckling a Snickers bar all day. Just like, no, you can be okay. You're okay. You're okay. And then I hit a point where I was like, I want to kill myself. Okay, cool. Let's go <laughs> eat a candy bar. And if, and I, and I've always been like, I was always like, if that's how I feel about this, Jesus Christ, let's not like find something else that we like even more than this, that is going to ruin my life. Like I, I also like, uh, other, other things about me that are very fun for comedy podcasts. Uh, my mom, uh, died, eight years ago uh she had had a she'd been sick with a disease called multiple system atrophy for a very long time um so and my grandmother was my best friend growing up and she died when i was right after i graduated college so i've always had this also like finite time clock ticking in my brain that feels very like don't waste your fucking time and to me like being hungover or losing time to an addiction or 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 anything like that, it felt like I was wasting time that I just always felt like I was chasing a clock. And I've, I've chilled out on that in the last few years, quite a bit more COVID I think was good for me in that regard. Cause it made me very like, you know, what are you chasing? Like you need to be happy with you here and like, like, you know, being present. And like, if you don't have it now, then it, then it doesn't exist basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, but that was a very big, a, a forward momentum moment that I, I appreciate about myself. Cause it's made me very motivated for a long time, but like that, uh, that was also that's also a big part of it because I'd see my friends, you know, in college, they'd be like hung over, they'd lose their whole weekend. And I'm just like, there's a ska band in town. I'm seeing them tonight. I'm like going out to them with brunch tomorrow. Like I got shit on my calendar, baby. We got things to do. Like I can't. Yeah. I don't want to have a headache for three days. <laughs> it's it's funny because I was looking at your podcast and I was like, holy shit, this woman has done everything. And yeah. the and now I know how and why. <laughs> and it's because yeah. There's been like six more hours in your days than everybody yeah. else and anybody else. And also you felt um you felt compelled to use them. Yes. The the podcast that's going up this week is with my friend Aaron Lazar, who's the singer in uh the giraffes. Nice. And when we were in our twenties, I think I was like twenty five and he was twenty six, uh he died. Uh, his heart, he had a heart attack and died, and wow. then he was brought back there on, you know, by uh, cops and ambulance, and then they brought him to the hospital, and he died again. And wow. then, like, it was in ICU, was in a coma for a couple of days, mm-hmm. and kept, like, kept dying. And now he has, like, a little iPod in his chest that keeps mm-hmm. him alive. The, uh, and when he's, when his heart goes, when his heart beat too, beats too fast, it does the, you know, the thing we've seen a million times in every sort of like uh, ER mm-hmm. drama where they're like, clear! And then they mm-hmm. zap the, that happens just inside his chest where there's two little nodules that attach the iPod to his heart. Wow. And it just, the yeah, so. Yeah. And I was talking to him about that because that's fucking wild. Yeah. And um, the, and actually when I was at his house, he has like the, you know, the bowl of uh, change and car key and one sewing needle and all the shit that you'll never use. And in that uh, bowl is uh, his old uh, defibrillator that, you know, was used for whatever, six or eight years. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and, you know, he, you know, I talked to him uh, frankly about it and he was like, yeah, you know, um, mm-hmm. dying cured me of any desire to die. Yeah. You know, that he, 
um, I think we all have a sort of, um, or many artists have a suicidal bent or um, mm -hmm. obsessed with darkness or mortality or whatever. And then when you get a taste of the real mortality, you're like, yeah. fuck no. Yeah, the, no. yeah. I want to live. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. The I got shipwrecked in my 20s and that... Um, that gave me a certain joie de vivre uh, mm -hmm. for a minute. Actually, there's a. Um, are you familiar with Tim Kreider? Did uh, he's a writer from Baltimore? He did The Pain, which was in the Free Weekly in Baltimore mm -hmm. for a while. That he got stabbed in the neck when he was in Greece, and he describes the year after he got stabbed in the neck as the greatest year of his life because wow. every yeah. day when he woke up, he was just like, "Fuck yeah, alive mm -hmm. again," you know. Yeah. The um. I to yeah, I totally get that. I mean, I when when my mom actually died is when I started touring afterwards because I never really felt before that that I like sh she was bedridden for the last three years of her life basically. Like um, MSA is a disease that it's very similar to Lou Gehrig's. It is in the same family of what Robin Williams had. Like uh, it basically her version of it was it's. Um, every connection in your brain just recircuits to a different connection so like the the part of your brain that tells you to move your arm forgets that that it doesn't move that arm anymore it does something else it's like very fucked up but i never felt like i could like plan my life ahead uh like, I'd be like okay well my schedule a tour in six months like i might need to go home for a funeral or whatever so i felt very like stuck in this like go like I, i'm stuck here and then when she died it was very like go like the and it was also how I dealt with with it. I I was just like I need to feel more alive than ever now, and that was just like touring, just being the only person that I knew in a thousand miles in any direction in the middle of the country, and just like learning to trust, like learning to just like trust, bet on myself, and trust myself again. Brandy, I'm so sorry. That sounds oh, like a yeah. really <laughs> horrific way to lose your mother, and um, yeah. and also you know an incredibly uh incredibly challenging way to sort of find yourself as an artist oh, um, and I, I mean I imagine too that you probably had a ton of conflicting emotions when uh, when she passed because mm -hmm. um, she was set free and you yep. were set free and mm -hmm. you lost your mom yeah no 100 100 percent like it was I mean it's a it's a grief that like I'm good with now it's been eight years but it, it's been it's been interesting where it pops up and where it doesn't and like how I've been I've been surprised by it in different ways too of just like oh okay like I never I I don't really give a shit about ever being married it was never thing I pictured myself but I remember the first wedding that I went to after my mom died it was like seeing parents together and I was like ooh I don't even want this and this is like bucking with me a lot okay um and also I mean my mom was also a very religious person uh so it it gave me more empathy at the end for her because she had a community that took came over and took care of her um but i mean my mom died thinking that like i was a good person but i was probably going to hell so that was like that's a part of it too where it's like well i don't know i'm a good person i like do a lot of good shit but whatever <laughs> and i now i have a lot of distance from it now and i feel i'm also she died three weeks before my 30th birthday and she had just turned 60. So if that's not a midlife crisis, I don't know what it is, man. <laughs> wow. But and I, but I also I told myself, I was like, if that, if like, I didn't want to, if I didn't numb out during any of that, n fuck, try to fuck with me is how I like. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the, I imagine, I mean, I hope that having gone through that mm -hmm. um, at 30, that um, the number one that fucking life is, uh, Shit! What's her name? The the hearts and unicorns, Lisa something. Um, Lisa Frank. Yes, yeah. I hope that your life is like a big sort of like Lisa Frank ice cream <laughs> shop right now. And the and and number two, I imagine that when it isn't, that you find yourself to be emotionally bulletproof, or at least that you have the tools to yes. process that shit. Well, I think it also gives you. So yeah, I was talking about Anna. Anna's my roommate, and like we were talking about like loss last night and how it like it's hard but it also it gives you a perspective that i think if you don't like, like my best friends my best friends are all people that have had like a tragedy of some kind when they were younger because i think it it grounded them in a perspective that you don't get unless you know what you can lose basically and then to have to survive it and ride it and confront yourself through that 
Um, and I like, yeah, I just, I feel very like, all right, I'll figure it out no matter what, like there are certain things that feel bittersweet, but it's also like, there are certain things that I'm like, that that will never upset me anywhere near as much as they used to. I mean, Matt, you said some shit to me on Twitter. Okay. I buried my mom. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't give a shit what you have to say to me. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I remember um, when 9-11 happened, the... Mm-hmm. It, it was like that, that was the same year that I got shipwrecked and having mm. been through that and survived that. And that was like a, a very sort of like small private thing. Um, it was like, you know, a very sort of uh, quiet, creeping yeah. terror. Then when 9-11 happened, I um, at least in the moment, I was like, I got this. You yeah. know, the at least this is happening to all of us that we're all going through this. You, you were know, in and, New York at that time? Yeah, yeah. Mm, and the and that like you know, we'll sort this out. And I, and I did feel, um, I did feel stronger for having already been through, I'd like lost a a, a good friend earlier that year and then been through the shipwreck. And then in the moment I was like, yeah, you know, I, I I got this. And then, but it's weird too, because I feel like in your forties, a lot of the bills from your Mm twenties are coming due Mm -hmm. and the, and then, um, I wonder, like, when I'm at a stoplight and a fucking Journey song comes on and I start breaking down at a stoplight, like, is this just 2001, man? Manif- <laughs> is this just the interest from 2001? Like, not even the shit itself, just the, you know, it's like uh, student mm-hmm. loans or credit card debt. They're like, yeah, yeah, no, you paid off the principal a long time ago. Yeah, but yeah. Now this is just, you'll just be paying interest on this shit for the rest of your life. But you could also look at it as, like, when you're in a moment of crisis, you cannot feel that. You know what I mean? Like when you're like, like if you were in a fucking car accident as is happening, like if you panic and you feel the emotions of the moment, then you will fucking die. But if you were like, this is what I need to do to make it through. So if you're feeling that stuff later, it means you're not in crisis anymore and your body is relaxed enough to give yourself that moment. I love that we're in this phase of uh, our comedy careers where it's yeah. like, let's just talk about trauma. <laughs> <laughs> oh totally totally i was just like i read your podcast description and i was like "Ooh, it'll get funny but also like what do you let's let's get to know each other <laughs> yeah yeah the, i mean you know this yeah this is like this yeah. is my fucking jam you know the, yeah um i it's it's weird because people uh we have a tendency to sort of apologize for oh I, i'm sorry i didn't mean to get uh to get dark or but the, mm-hmm. man that's the shit that i fucking live for the, oh for sure is and you know, it's been said before, but that's, I think that's how we learn to comedy mm-hmm. is by, um, holy shit, I have this thing in my mm-hmm. life, in my head, whether it's, um, whether it's a real thing or just sort of like shame that I imagine or anxiety that I'm bringing on myself or worry or what's going to happen in the future. And, you know, you don't know how to deal with it. And the, and we don't have a sort of clearly articulated strategy of the, um, I'm going to compartmentalize and then deal with this. Uh, eight years from now, I'm going to start crying in a Kroger. That's the mm-hmm. plan. That's how I'll deal with that. <laughs> so then the, the only way, I mean, one of the ways in, in which we deal with it is to, uh, to yell at our friends. Mm-hmm. You know, the, um, I just like, uh, screamed at my buddy rad via text message for a while today like ah fuck all this fucking shit fuck fuck yeah, fuck yeah. you know the and then another thing is just to uh to mock it mm-hmm. um to mock it in a room full of strangers who might, would probably rather be watching the game yeah <laughs> you know, the... yeah but it takes the power back you know absolutely it totally t- it's all about taking the power back i mean i i always think it's like Stephen Colbert has gotten so fucking corny, but I always remember this speech. I forget when it was. At some point, I heard him talk about how, like, laughter is the sound of, like, you cannot laugh and be afraid in the moment of laughter because it is a sound that basically is, like, I am here and I am full of joy. Fuck you. Is And, like, that is a thing that I think of often where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to talk about some dark shit because if I get people to laugh at it in that pr- moment that they're laughing, it is not hurting them, you know? So... It's so interesting the because I think Beckett said um, every time a character laughs, it's sig- uh, signifying an, an emotion that has died, mm-hmm. and the and I think both of those quotes are are true. Mm-hmm. But I think yeah. you know I think it's describing sort of a different kind of laughter. Um, mm-hmm. Colbert is an interesting character too because I I, I do think I think he's um, 
I think he's a good person. I think he's, yeah. you know, uh, incredibly intelligent and obviously very funny. And yeah. I can't hold it in my head that he's also Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I come from such a uh, sort of atheist, secular, um, cynical. I mean, you know, my mother comes from a family of 17 children. Mm hmm. Doesn't get much more Catholic than that. And I, yes. I, I got the sort of amorphous cloud of guilt that hovers over, mm -hmm. um, you know, everything that you do. I, the, I, have a, I drive a 2005 Honda Element. It has the little beep beep uh, yeah. thing to lock it. And every time I do that, I feel like it's um, ostentatious wealth, you know, that I'm like yeah. clamoring. Look, my car beeps, you know, yeah, that yeah. It's, it's fucking bullshit, you know, yeah. the, um, but the but we do carry that with us the um did you what's your what's your relationship with religion and was it um was it tricky uh watching your mother uh, be so sick and mm -hmm. investing in religion or could you see that it was like providing comfort to her and that it was useful or well so my mom, my mom was raised like my mom is like a quarter like a half Italian. She was raised like Latin Mass Catholic, like very yeah. like she was raised like in in it. Like I I remember like that. My grandparents from that side fucking. My grandfather was cool. My grandmother sucked. She was just a very. Uh, I remember the only good memory I have of her is her taking me and my brother to go see Ace Ventura too, <laughs> and she hated that movie so much. That for the rest of her life, the first question she would ask me when she saw me is she'd go, do you still like that Jim Carrey? And I'd say, <laughs> yeah, I, he's so funny because I'm a child of the 90s. And she would go, ugh, and then she wouldn't ask me any other questions. So she died and I was a mystery to her because she hated Jim Carrey that much. So that's my grandmother on that side. So my, that is my mom's mom. My mom was like a very kind hearted, could not say no people pleaser person that like was raised Catholic. And then my, my dad was raised Methodist. My dad's side of the family is Methodist, but like, not really like they like believe, but like my dad believes in God and heaven and stuff, but like, he also didn't go to church on Sundays and my dad got married in a Catholic church. But when they had us, he was like, Ooh, my kids are not Catholic. Uh, just so you know, we'll, we're converting to being Methodist. And what, well, I don't know. He should have probably talked to her before that, but <laughs> Um, my, I mean, I love my dad. He's kind of an asshole about things like that though, but I appreciate it because I'm glad I wasn't raised Catholic because I also in Sunday school, I, I was, I'm a smart, I'm a smart person. I've read very early. I always questioned a lot and I was the first kid in my Sunday school that could like read fluently. And the, there were other kids in the class that like, were like, I guess call on Brandy again. Cause she's a good reader. And I was like, I am a good reader. You should work on it. Like I, <laughs> So I, I like immediately like didn't respect any of the kids I was in class with. And I remember very specifically in first grade in Sunday school, learning the creation story and thinking that it was bullshit because I didn't really understand what like, you know, metaphor was or whatever the fuck. But they were like, and they were also very little. My teacher was very literal about it. And I was like, okay, but like, so what God was just like in the dark for a while. Who are God's parents? This doesn't make sense to me. And I had questions because I was trying to understand it. And then I remember them being like, you just need to believe. And it was a bad thing that I wasn't just going with it. And I was like, no, but I've been told not to just believe what somebody says because that's how you end up in a van. And <laughs> you're supposed to question, so why is this any different? And I like, I remember being a kid fighting this teacher and then being tried to make feel bad for it. And I was like, mm, I think this is all bullshit. So, from, but the deal was I had to get confirmed in seventh grade funny story our confirmation song was i believe i can fly by r kelly <laughs> which is hilarious now um and then the day at the the week after i was like no i'm done you told me that i had to get confirmed and now i never go back i will give you christmas and mother's day and that's about it and um you know and my whole childhood i fought with my mom about stuff because i just didn't she had she still had a lot of her catholic shit of like um she believed that if you were not saved, you were going to hell. And I was like, but little kids die all over the world that like, what if, if a, so if a, uh, a missionary didn't get to them, then they died. And she's like, yes. And I was like, that's stupid. It makes no sense. Yeah. And so we just fought about a lot. I mean, you know, we, we fought about a lot of stuff like that. And it was the, I mean, the majority of our relationship was like me 
pushing and questioning. I she hit a point later in her life, I think, where she like she appreciated like sh- there was cognitive distance that she was like coming more and more to terms with. Like I have a I have a gay uncle that when he got he got engaged and got married and my mom was like excited for her brother it was a younger brother but her older brother my uncle bobby's an asshole and he's just a trumper tea party asshole and he was like i can't believe he's getting married I mean, sanctity of marriage and my mom was like it, it hit that catholic button in her head and she was like i don't know what to do i'm like happy for, like clearly they love each other and i was like yes let's talk about this and like you know we she got she was very happy and like i you know facetimed her in to the wedding because she was couldn't be there in person and like was happy for it so like she i think she, there were things that like she just she had not been raised to be a questioning person like you know she just mm-hmm. was not and she just didn't find that on her own so it's like i knew that she was a good person and like i because i could see she would do anything for anybody but then she would just like there was so much fear there and i think i recognized it as that very early on and was like no that's like not the way i'm gonna be and i don't know where that came from but i just i just fought it forever and like i now i'm like very um like i don't i don't i don't go to church i don't consider myself christian whatsoever i like the idea of there being something but i'm not tied to any of it where it's like oh that would be nice and i think in moments where you need comfort like if that is a thing that comforts you cool go for it but like you know i mean like i you know there are moments where i like will be like man what would my grandmother do right now and i feel like i'm like i feel like her close to me but Mm -hmm. like i don't is she actually there i don't know and i don't think it matters i think it's whatever you do to find comfort in this life is like the important thing um so I don't really have like beliefs around it, but I have just like, what would be nice in this moment? Oh, that would be if I like felt like I could talk to somebody right now and that would, you know, and it felt like they were more here or something, then that's good. But like, I don't really like, you know, I'll probably it's, die and that's it. But whatever. I won't know till I do it. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> who cares? The the ultimate fuck around and find out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's it's fascinating to me that um you know that we see religion and religious texts as um or that par- a lot of parents see them as central to uh, mm-hmm. educating their their child and you know facilitating yeah. a child's development and you know I mean obviously whatever the three hundred years ago the. Mm-hmm. Um, the church was a repository for sort of all the stories that had just been sort of handed down forever. Yeah. The, um, but it seems wild to me. I mean, granted, I'm not a parent, so I don't. Mm-hmm. The maybe I'm I'm the, not the person who should be weighing in on this. But it seems so fascinating to me that a parent would want to instill in their child um, religious belief, mm-hmm. which for most religious beliefs beliefs the a central tenant is well, don't ask why. Yeah. Just believe that mm-hmm. they're sort of teaching you not to question. Yeah. Um, which is, but but also the, mm-hmm. you know, if there's one thing in my life that has made it like worthwhile for me to be here, it would be rock and roll. It's yeah. something that has delighted me from the like the very it it's entranced me the from the mm-hmm. very first moments that I heard it, and still now like if I'm. Uh, if I'm driving and a fucking Buddy Holly song com- comes on the radio or whatever, I'll sit in the car like yeah. to hear the end of the song. You know the mm-hmm. and so much, um, so much popular music, for, um, blues and rock and roll and all it comes out of songs of worship and mm-hmm. music in the church and the oh you know the the church was the one place where they had an organ mm-hmm. and there's living in Brooklyn. We'd still walk by, you know, on Sunday, you'd mm-hmm. still walk by a t- tiny little church with the doors open. They're fucking rocking out in there. Yeah. Um, the, but just a church or any church makes my fucking skin crawl. Oh, for sure. <laughs> well, and I think it also like a lot of church now, because you know, a lot of it's about making money has gotten away from like, like those moments when you are like singing, you're in community and you're feeling alive and you're connected to everybody. And that I think is like, there is something worthwhile about that. I mean, I, we all seek out community. It's like we seek out community through, through music or like we're in comedy. It's like, you know, starting, I like that, that is my tribe. And I think like for a lot of people, especially in more in older times, like the church was like where you found your tribe because it's like okay i have my coworkers or i have this thing i do on sundays 
and my boss isn't there. So maybe that I like that better, <laughs> you know? And I mean, I, the fire and brimstone shit is like, I've, I've never fucked with any of that, but it's like, you know, I remember after like after church, there were always these like donut Sundays and stuff where people just be running around and hanging out. And it was like, all right, well, this is everyone's fun now. We weren't yeah. fun like three hours ago. Like, why can't we just like hang out like this all the time? But like, I think we have this like in, I mean, America has such a driven, like, if you are not producing something, then are you even alive uh, attitude to it? <laughs> so it's like to be like, well, we need to have, an, we need an activity to, to justify this, this feeling of community. And I think mm. like church is like so much of that to a certain degree too. Um, it's it's wild because it, if you could strip out all the the misogyny and the racism and the homophobia and the uh, judgment and mm -hmm. uh, hypocrisy, church would fucking rock. You know, yeah. where it's just like, oh, we're all going to get together, like mm -hmm. you know, for a couple hours one day a week and just sing together yeah. about the joy of being alive. Like that fucking rules. But yeah. you strip all that stuff out, mm -hmm. and that's all the church that's under there. Now yeah. you just have a community center. A hundred percent. Well, it's like, I mean, I'm not like I, friends with a lot of witches and women in LA in my thirties <laughs> yeah. that happens, but it's like, you know, you see them just like having a blast on like celebrating full moons and new moons and solstices. And it's like, if you think about it back in the day, it's like, yeah, okay. The, the harvest should be fucking celebrated because now yeah. you're going to live through the winter. And like there, the, all of that makes so much more sense organically because then it's like you are celebrating triumph and, and a human triumph and a, and, a, and, a, and a, a celebration of being alive for having made it through the season and like thriving or not or being thankful for a previous season when you did or something. And like that that stuff appeals to me so much more because it's very like more rooted in, in our world and like a, you know, a, a, a movement forward too. Yeah. Um, the... <laughs> Matt Allen O'Martin has this brilliant podcast mm -hmm. that I've been meaning to fucking record forever, and it's about oh the music. music one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Have you done it? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, oh, I gotta listen to it. The and I was I was sort of trying to do my homework for that the other day and thinking in my head about um about albums that that sort of changed everything for me or mm -hmm. that um you know really transformed my consciousness. And one of them was uh, uh, this is not a test. Uh, Bikini Kill, and yeah, not. Not necessarily because it spoke to me, but it was sort of like, um, it was almost like hearing Los Crudos, like hearing um, a hardcore band singing in a language I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. the, I remember being 15 and hearing that record and being like, I, I love this. I love the way this sounds. The I love this woman's voice. But what are what are they so mad about? Yeah. And that was the sort of beginning of asking a question that I'm still mm -hmm. gathering answers for the um, I feel like you may have come out of a little bit of that scene or that maybe some of those artists were tremendously yes. meaningful for you. They, they absolutely were. I, I'm also like a, I'm like a, I'm a huge ska kid too, was like kind of my <laughs> thing. I'm a ska punk kid where like I, but the like, like Real Big Fish was my favorite band growing up, which is funny oh because okay. those lyrics are, those lyrics are also very angry and very depressed. You wouldn't think it but when you actually go and listen to their music. You're like, oh, this is a very depressed person <laughs> who's packaging in a very funny way. Like I actually I thanked I thanked them on my first album as like they were like my first comedy influence, I think. Wow. And because they just growing up, you didn't see comedy shows. Like you couldn't go to a live comedy show, but like they did bits and stupid stuff on stage. And I remember seeing my very first show was um, Teen Heroes, Zebrahead, and Real Big Fish uh, at the 9:30 Club in DC. I, nice. So I'm an 80, I'm an 84 baby. So like 98, I was in like eighth grade, and like that's like my age basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, that was my first show, and it was like I remember them sound checking the drums for for zebra for zebra head because and they were so much they were so loud that it felt like my heart was like coming online yeah it's like it, in this room full of just like rock music and i was like oh shit this is my favorite thing is being in this room like with with that 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 like like i i love music so much that I never wanted to pursue it as a career because i was just like i will i don't want to 
know too much behind the curtain. And it's so funny because I'm friends with a ton of musicians and it's like, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do, baby. I know a lot. <laughs> it's getting real ugly, real gross. <laughs> yeah. But with comedy, I was always just like, it feels like a, a way to perform too but i didn't mind ripping that band-aid completely off for it like i will still stand in awe of music and rarely do i feel that with comedy but like yeah i mean just being in a pit and like dancing it just i felt it i i've always felt like i it always feels like an out-of-body experience like everything all i am is in community in that moment and do I even have a body right now? I feel like I am just energy recharging. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm not even like a woman or a girl or a person. I just feel like I am just a, an energy in a space of people celebrating it. <laughs> I remember going to see Dinosaur Jr. when I was 15 yeah. or 16. And the Ooh, kick, they're loud. <laughs> oh, my God. The kick drum was so loud mm -hmm. that I it just sort of encapsulated you and your clothing yeah. would flap against you. Yeah. And that sensation of being, um, you know, I mean, Pixies talked about a uh, planet of sound, mm -hmm. you know, just being enveloped in that. And it was almost yeah. this protective bubble. And people talk about like, um, you know, effect boomer voice here, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so loud. I couldn't hear myself think. And yeah. when you're, when you're a tortured yeah, teenager, <laughs> It being so loud you can't think is such a fucking bomb for you in oh, that moment. You know, it's yeah. a moment of release and transformation. Yeah, drown it out. Drown it yeah. out, please. <laughs> yeah, it, it really... And, like, I I also just, like... I play, I was, like, I play soft, played softball and I was on swim team, but I wasn't, like, a jock kid. So it was also just, like, a very physical release in a way that I wasn't, like, getting from anywhere else in my world. Where it was just, like, I, I mean... I'd be like soaked in sweat at the end of a show, you know? I mean, and then be, and then be like, why don't I have a boyfriend? And I'm just punching people in the pit. I'm just like, what about <laughs> a 16 year old girl? Like doing spin kicks is not uh, attractive to people. <laughs> I, I remember going to those shows and then waking up the next day and just being sore in yeah. every single part of your body. Like yep. the, like somebody had just taken like a ball peen hammer and just hit, every fucking square inch of your body mm -hmm. and it hurt so much and it felt so good felt great. That, you, that you had sort of like been through this uh tenderizer with um a bunch of your closest friends or a bunch mm -hmm. of strangers who then yeah. were were like your people mm -hmm. afterwards the, well and it's and it's also just like a group of strangers coming together that like you know all know the words to this song that means something to you and also you know i i i went to like a very a public school but a pretty preppy one so like i don't know what the fuck most people are listening to like i you know i, I a lot of my best friends here in la they, they love like beyonce and britney spears and stuff and like whatever that's mm -hmm. like you like what you like that's what you like but like it feels so validating to walk to, into a room full of people that are all that know all the words to a song that like no one else in my like day-to-day -day life in comedy even knows what the fuck i'm talking about and then i'm like i am right i am right look they're here too <laughs> Was uh was nine thirty like your home club? Yeah, I went there. It was a nine thirty club, the Black Cat in DC. Uh -huh. Um, I was at and and then there was like um, uh, like my friends like local punk bands and stuff would play at like little like uh community centers and stuff like that too. So yeah, I was either yeah I was seeing everything I could. And then when I went to college in Philly, man, I'd have favorite bands come to town. And that's a beautiful thing about the East Coast is you have cities are all so close to each other so like less than jake would come to town and i could see them in philly new jersey new york baltimore dc richmond if it was on a weekend if i really wanted i could go to boston with five hours away like yeah. you know so i would and, and because i didn't drink all my like i spent as much as anybody else in college all my money went towards tickets <laughs> that's like where i spent all my money um so i would just i would just i couldn't get enough of it classes would be over and i'd be like all right cool awesome going to a show and then that was where I was constant. I was just at shows all the time. And then I just, I'm friends with a bunch of musicians just from those days and shit. Cause I would just hang out with people afterwards. And then like, um, yeah, that it, it was my, it was my favorite thing. Cause it all, and I think also it just like helped me. It centered me, you know, I remember the first few years I started doing comedy. I really loved it, but I wasn't going to shows at all. I remember mm -hmm. the first like music show I went to after like probably a year or two of just like grinding it with like open mics and stuff. I was like, Oh, I forgot how much I love this. And I was like, I need yeah. to, I need to balance this in my life too, because this is like, 
this is my first love. Like this is this is this is why I do the other things too. But like this is like where the this is the feeling of freedom that it's important for me to like continually check in with. And it it it's similar to a moment when you're on stage and you like feel yourself killing in a room and like anything you say is going to work, but not like it's it, they're they're in a similar just like out of body space. But like you're you're the maestro in one and the other you're just like a nameless person and audience that doesn't even exist in that moment, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's and there's the thing about being on stage and doing comedy where you're singular mm-hmm. and the and everybody knows your name and then being a fan in music it's a similar sensation but it's the yeah. exact opposite thing of I'm a nameless um face in the crowd. I'm you know I'm yeah. one of one of many. I'm sort of like deep in the tribe. Mm-hmm. The um I'm a couple years older than you. I was born in 77. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I grew up with was uh uh, the dudes on stage and the girls watching or the girls yeah. on the side of the stage. The Was there one artist or one, uh, like a comic or a band? Did, did, well, first of all, did you grow up with that separation too? And was there an artist where you were like, oh, fuck, she can do it. I can do it too. Yeah. Well, y- you know what it was? Like I, where I grew up, I, from, from, I was a baby until fifth grade. I was the only girl in like a, three mile radius so my like first best friends were all dudes so like i i even still tend to i have a lot of really good guy friends because i tend to just have i i I feel like i was like socialized as a guy in a lot of ways at a very (laughs) early age because i just like um that that like thing of just like be pretty on the wall was just never a thing I, I thought it just wasn't a thing that entered my mind really because I was just like cool I'm going to, I'm going to a show with my bros tonight they're in the pit I'm in the pit like it yep. just felt like one of one of them and like um I yeah it just I I mean I was a tomboy for sure <laughs> definitely still am and like I didn't I also just like pushed against it, that was another thing like I my mom wanted me in dresses she wanted me to be this cute little like wearing dresses like little blonde blue-eyed kid and like i just wasn't it was a rebellion against that too so i think like that probably served you really well down the line it it has it for sure has because i think i also just like i because i always had guy friends like guys just never seemed like a real mystery to me Uh um there were it wasn't this like oh i have a crush on that like it was i have a crush on that guy like i don't even i was always like oh you have a crush on fucking danny (laughs) Danny eats his boogers, dude. All right, whatever. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, weird. It's weird you like like my guy friends. Um, so I've been, and I, I, you know, I've had, I'm I'm straight. I have I've had boyfriends and I, you know, and stuff. But like, I just never, I I never played a lot of those the 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 courting games that I think we're supposed to because I just always had good guy friendships that I'd like. You know, fucking all my guy friends and um, you know, it's funny when I started comedy in L.A. All my guy friends growing up, we would like fucking fight and shit i would like wrestle we like we all like wrestled and shit like we were like really into like jackass and wrestling and stuff in high school and it was great and i remember and my 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 guy friends in college were kind of a similar thing and i remember starting comedy in la and being like oh you can be careful otherwise you're gonna like bully these people when you think you're just hanging out (laughs) because i just was like oh there's like you know a lot a lot of guys in comedy just have more of a like they they haven't found their tribe until they have it um and i think i i it took me a minute to be like oh okay you like didn't have like these groups of friends or i just like you know push somebody or something and be like oh and i'm like oh i forget never mind i get it cool we're be my friend we're fine i'm just doing this because i'm just fucking with you i'm sorry (laughs) it's it's funny sometimes those early friendships those early relationships or the you know the early separations you learn or don't learn mm-hmm. end up being so fucking helpful down the line. Yeah. I, I had a drinking buddy when I was uh, 16, 17, uh, my friend Talcott, and mm-hmm. uh, she had like rainbow colored dreads and, you know, we would fucking drink cough syrup together and, yeah. uh, and get a bottle of whiskey and drink, you know, and we just hung out all the time and, um, and would sleep in the same bed, or bed together mm-hmm. or sleep yeah. in the fucking woods or whatever the, and never, fooled around yeah and then um and i'm like i'm a straight white bro mm-hmm. i'm fucking right down the middle yeah. the, and then in the last 10 or 15 years when um 
trans folks and non-binary folks suddenly became more visible. Mm-hmm. The that was something that was tricky for me to wrap my head around, mm-hmm. and then sort of like uh, was I was out on the road and renewed my friendship with my friend Talkit, and mm-hmm. um, you know discovered that she was non-binary, and then I was mm-hmm. like. Oh yeah, no, that fucking makes perfect sense, mm-hmm. and it was sort of hidden in plain view the whole time. Yeah. And any time I need to um, sort through my latent homophobia, transphobia, mm-hmm. misogyny, all I have to do is think about those two kids mm-hmm. just hanging out together and being like, "This song rules. This song sucks." Yeah. The and the and you know it's sort of helped me sort through so much of that shit mm-hmm. um but it's funny too then when you see uh kids being taught uh you know uh pink is for girls and blue is for boys yeah. and the, then you just sort of like oh fuck yeah. you're in, you're gonna be in for you're gonna be in for some hard shit when you yeah get older well yeah it's it's wild it's like i mean one of my my one of my best friends from home is like my friend lewis that I, we've been friends since he moved to town in in the end of seventh grade and like you know we like hiked yosemite together last summer and i you know definitely have some girlfriends are like it's just like you and your guy friend is like your boyfriend okay with that and i was like yes he has like literally been my my best friend since we were 13 like if anybody in my life had a problem with that that like we're we're people like yeah, you know yeah. it yeah it just it, it, yeah i i'm i'm thank i'm very thankful for a lot of those friendships and stuff it's nice <laughs> when uh when I was doing this sort of uh, last second, uh, sort of trying to get to know you and to get your mm-hmm. know, to know your work a little bit before we were doing the podcast, the, one of the first things I came upon was uh, uh, you doing a set in uh, 2017 when I think all of us were fucking reeling um, <laughs> by the um, the election outcome yeah. and the and you sort of uh, harnessed the crowd to just like scream together and yeah. I feel like we're still screaming and yeah. the um I know <laughs> when I was like driving back uh just now uh to do the podcast I was like well I don't want to the um I want to sort of know a little bit more about Brandy's work and and not just mm-hmm. the you know from that sort of like tragic moment in time for all of us yeah, and, uh, yeah. and I just threw on spot I was driving so I just threw on Spotify and I threw on the top track and it was like uh you know um uh, where are my 2013 lonely ladies at? And I was just like, oh, God, the, it, uh, it, one thing is that it, it fucking, it never ends for women, does it? And the, <laughs> and, and the other thing is the listening to your work, there's a, a real, I get a real sense of the sort of, it's comedy and we're mm-hmm. up there for laughs, the, mm-hmm. but also the, um, you know, there's definitely your personal life uh, mm-hmm. woven throughout that, and then um, th- the political too. You know, yeah. the um, am I okay? Are we okay? Are we going to be okay? Mm-hmm. The um, Jesus, the um, election night of 2016. I ended up going to the. I think I was at the comedy store. And it yeah. was like uh, Stan Hope and Rogan and Burt Kreischer and a bunch of people like they were podcasting the election results. Yeah. And the and when it came in, Joe Rogan was like, are we going to be OK? <laughs> you will be, Joe. You'll and, be yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He fucking made it like a bandit. The, yeah. <laughs> but in that moment to hear somebody like Rogan mm-hmm. have and he. And it was scary because he was yeah. like the he appeared shook, you know, yeah. and the and for somebody like that to to be like, oh, oh my God, you know, are are, are we going to be OK? Mm-hmm. The um, I don't know. Talk a little bit about. Uh, I don't know, stitching your politics into humor and I don't know, telling jokes in bars and trying to get gut laughs from people. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're sort of like uh, the we're obligated to mix the fart yeah. jokes and boob jokes and butt jokes up with mm-hmm. the, here's a funny thing about refugees, you know? Yeah. The- <laughs> totally. Well, I mean, I, I've always felt like, I mean, being a, 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 being anybody, honestly, but being especially a, uh, a minority or in, in any way, like a woman, a person of color, like anything, or like a person that came from a, a lower class being, being a person that is the world 
expects to fail in some way, holding a microphone, making your voice louder than the rest of the world is um, inherently a political act, you know, mm-hmm. yep. to raise to raise your voice above a room of people that like went to Harvard or like, you know, have money, you know, family money or something. And like there, there are people that, you know, they can't help their circumstances with some of that shit either. And they yeah. have analyzed it and tried to work on it. But like, um, so I try to remember that whenever I'm on stage with shit, because I'm like, you know, I, uh, I think it's important. I mean, like I, I have a lot of really stupid jokes too, but I try to make them about shit because I think it's like important to, to kind of try to trick people into seeing something a little bit different than they would have. And I think it's, I, I think a lot of it is also because of like, I was raised, um, I was like, always like the girl hanging out with the dudes or something where it's like i i understand like this world a little bit more than people might know or like i like know how to talk i know how to talk bro pretty well yeah and i think so like it's funny because like uh my podcast is called lady to lady and we have like a ton of lady fans but when you look at like my album stats most of my stand-up fans are dudes you know women like my stand-up too but i have a lot of guys that love my stand-up and they're because they, i think i just like I think guys tend to like stand up more because it's a more welcoming space for them a lot of the time Um, anyway. But like, I have just always been pretty good. I think at like getting through, I think to guys, because I kind of can speak it a little bit more sometimes. And I try to just use like a really, a really dumb idea to convey something real (laughs) is, is, is usually my style when I'm trying to do. That's, that's really interesting to hear because the, when I started publishing, I started publishing uh, like digital only through Amazon. So it was published to, and this was whatever, 2010, 2011. And so it was published directly to iPads and Kindles and stuff like that. And my thinking was, um, you know, it's a male writing about sort of um, quote unquote male experiences of like adventuring out, being a drunk, the um, rock and roll. And then it's delivered via technology. So mm-hmm. I figured that it would be sort of like, I don't know, the fucking wired readership or something mm-hmm. like that of yeah. um, uh, techie bros, basically. Mm-hmm. And I've discovered over the years that overwhelmingly my um, the, the audience for my writing uh, is women, mm-hmm. which... Uh, um, which makes sense because women read like 10 times more than men. Yeah. The, um, that's yeah. just a fact. That's not mm-hmm. pandering. Um, no, the, and, uh, and I took pride at one point that, um, that I was able to sort of overcome the, my chauvinistic upbringing and mm-hmm. be able to speak in a egalitarian enough voice that, um, that sort of everybody got it. But yeah. then also the I was like on Twitter uh, last night and I saw the um, you know a thread of the sort of women who were like oh I would have totally written to Jeffrey Dahmer and like he didn't mm-hmm. hurt his victims that much you know I think he's such an interesting guy and yeah. then now I'm like oh do women just read my shit because I'm another <laughs> fucking toxic white bro and that's like the I am those women's bottle of Hershey's chocolate syrup where they're like I know it's not good for me but I can't stop. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there are, I think, I think a lot of women too are just like, they want to, they want to see what's happening inside the male brain a lot. And yeah. a lot of guys like are, 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 have a hard time sharing or even being in touch enough with, cause we don't, we don't give men the tools in their society to, to be able to like identify, like your, your emotions are like angry and horny or all that like <laughs> men are given um on a societal level and then it's like no but there's like a whole there's so much more that like you will feel and like you should not there's be a able third, to name there's it. a third yeah. emotion that's both angry and horny yes of course <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> exactly and so i think it's just like it so so like i think women enjoy reading like men that have like interrogated that and tried to find different thoughts and feelings and like actually talked about their experiences and aren't just like yeah no things are cool and meanwhile, there's like fucking Rammstein playing in your brain. And it's like, <laughs> what, what's happening in there? <laughs> you know, <laughs> one one of my best friends here is uh, my neighbor across the street, Oscar, a Mexican immigrant. And he's a mm-hmm. contractor and we hang out all the time. And he's the 
um, it's sort of like that Warner Brothers cartoon of like uh, morning Sam, morning Ralph. You know, we punch mm-hmm. our time cards yeah. and the and then go off and buy a six hundred dollar truck and fix it together and sell it for a thousand dollars or whatever. The, yeah, yeah. But um, the I had a broken dryer the other day and I was like, uh, hey Oscar, you know, I made I made coffee. You want to come over for a cup of coffee? And I got him over to like help yeah. me fix the dryer. And I was Thanks. complaining about how helpless I am with tools and <laughs> the and, I, and he was like. Mishka, like, what were you doing when, like, other guys are learning how to, like, (laughs) you know, use a fucking screwdriver? And I was like, well, I learned to write about my feelings. Yeah. And poetry, bitch. (laughs) He he just gave me the funniest look. Like, (laughs) (laughs) you what? (laughs) Yeah. But that's why community is important because you need both of those people because then like if he were to read your stuff, he'd be like, oh, I actually feel that way too sometimes. And even if he like sometimes has like that a lock something and then he can fix your dryer, you know, and these things are all equally valid and important. <laughs> he's He's been asking me about shrooms lately because like mm-hmm. mushrooms are like so everywhere now. Yeah, yeah. There's such a thing right the, now. That, um, you know, he was like watching something about, you know, about them on TV the other night and was asking me sort of very pointed questions. So I yeah. really, this is, this is my hope for the new year is that I get yeah. to sort of like sit down and fucking uh, eat mushrooms with Oscar. And we'll talk about our feelings together and maybe yeah. fix a dryer. Oh, totally. I hope that, I hope that happens for you guys. What a, what a fun goal in 2023. <laughs> Ridiculous. That's what, sweet. um. For the woman who seems to have done just about fucking everything, what what do you want to do that you haven't done yet? I mean, I I want to tour. I want to do stand up overseas. I want to see how much my American bullshit holds up uh, <laughs> over there. I I was gonna do it in 2020, and then obviously, uh, and now it's kind of just like you know ramping back up and figuring shit out. I. I'm ready for another album to record. Um, I also uh, am pretty sure, pretty sure I'm starting a fucking. There's another eye roll. I think I'm. <laughs> I think I'm gonna launch a record label next year. Uh, that is a fantastic way to lose money. The, if <laughs> yeah, you have, I if know. you have a storeroom of extra cash laying around that you need to burn through, that I cannot recommend a record yeah. label more. Well, it's like I mean, I really. Would you I, so be, was, be doing comedy or music com- or comedy? It'd be for okay. com- it'd be for comedy because like, so I self released my first album, um, and then I actually I produced a, uh, I have a compilation album that I produced called Burn This Election that we recorded two days before the election in 2016 and released it two days after, and it was the the wow. whole purpose of it is like cool. Let's like burn our election jokes because everyone's got jokes they're real proud of because this has been a fucked up time. Let's like put them on and then we'll like raise money for charity. And we like made like five thousand dollars for rain basically because like oh Donald Trump would hate supporting rape victims so let's raise money for him basically you know for that and um it's a great really cathartic it's like a house party show we recorded it it's like twenty three performers um three minute sets each and like I you know self pr- produce that and like put it out too so I like have two albums I've produced basically at this point because I I also I'm a real like I. I the producer side of my brain I like turning that on as much as the creative side of my brain like Mm -hmm. I really enjoy understanding how all of that shit works because I also have just like you see talent get fucked so hard in this industry and I just am such and and I think I came up as like a DIY punk ska kid and just always like that has always been my ethos so when I see people that I forget how many people don't have that and I'm just like, why the hell would you trust them or give them your money to do whatever? And so many comedy labels, it's a 50-50 deal. And I was always like, fuck that. I mean, yeah. my 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 album is like, you know, and like I'm not a famous comic at all. My album has paid my rent since 2016 when it came out. Like that's it, fantastic. Yeah. And that's because I put it out on spot or on, you know, put it out. It's it's in rotation, Sirius XM, and you know, mm-hmm. makes good money. And like to the number of people I know that are that are, are more famous than me that like I make more money a month than you do because you got a bad record deal and like they didn't promote your shit and like they but they're making as much money as you and they haven't done shit for you it makes me crazy and all the shit that's been happening recently with like uh I don't give a fuck 800 pound gorilla and like the spoken <laughs> giants because I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna do anything with them so go yeah, fuck yeah. them you know mm. like watching all that happen and watching them mess with people's money 
And knowing that like the best deal that they're going to give anybody is maybe 60, 40 is disgusting. And, but now Sirius XM won't accept anything from anybody that's not on an album. That's not on a label basically. So I am like, all right, I've always had it in my brain. I was like, you can't start a label till you're in your forties, Brandy. You can't fucking do it. <laughs> um, but I'm ready to record a new one. So it's like, we're going to bump that up a couple of years, I guess. So, I mean, I also recorded another, um, another compilation album called burn this pandemic that's a bunch of pandemic jokes that's like raising money for sila that has that's like in process right now and is going to get re released at the beginning of next year that's probably going to be like the first album on the label when it all kind of comes out um but it's like because I, I want to do these like topical joke things but it's like that's not going to be on your album and yeah, the yeah. deal the deal is like the money that it makes in Sirius xm for a year goes to the charity and after that you get all rights i don't give a shit after that yep. but i think that there is like there is no way, I think, to create a comedy union in a live performance sense with clubs because it's just not going to happen and we're all feral cats. But <laughs> I do think that like a, you know, comedian owned like like a, a co-op of sorts where like you are actually treated well in like the label side of it is possible. And like that's kind of my neck, what my sights are on next is figuring that out because it's like. I mean, I'm on like a text thread with a bunch of like female headliners and who are like big names who are like, you know, tour and shit. And I like to hear them just be like, I made like 300 bucks last month from Sirius XM. What the fuck? And I'm like, what? You're getting fucked so bad. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you letting this happen? And it's because so many people just still have this, like they want to be a company man or a company woman in their, in their brain. And I'm like, bitch, be the company. Like yeah. <laughs> it's not, they, there are so many vultures in comedy that want to take everything from you. And it's like, no, you are the talent. You are the product. Anybody that gets a penny from you should be fucking thankful for that penny because they would have nothing without you. And I just, I, I, I feel it in my bones. And it makes me crazy. And like, I'm thankful that I have, that I'm good at that side of things. And I understand that a lot of people aren't. And it's like, all right, but I'm just going to figure it out because I want people to be treated fairly. So you know, it's just not, it, it It makes me feel insane that people are just like, no, I guess I'll just go with the weird record deal that like takes most of my money and only like submit some of my tracks to Sirius XM because they're putting out like 20 albums this month. And, you know, but I have to do it because my manager told me to do it. It's like, who's your manager? Some loser that just got into it because they like couldn't be friends with rock stars. But that's why they're a comedy manager. <laughs> it's, it's weird working in the arts because there's, um, you know, I think we grew up with this sort of dichotomy or the, we're programmed with this dichotomy of um, are you doing something that's good for yourself? Are you being yeah. selfish or are you doing something that's are you doing being generous? Are you being yeah. unselfish? Are you doing something that's good for everybody else? And in the pandemic, we saw that wearing a fucking mask yeah. is something that is selfish where you're doing mm -hmm. good for yourself and protecting mm -hmm. yourself. And it's mm -hmm. also it's benevolent. It's altruistic. You're helping yeah. everyone else. The whenever when I'm on the road, when I do shows, I get a guarantee, period. Mm -hmm. I'm going to yeah. try and get the biggest guarantee I can get. But mm -hmm. if I can't get a big guarantee, I'm going to get a small guarantee. Mm -hmm. And I always feel like such a dick. And people are always like, oh, man, so and so played here and they didn't have a guarantee. And the. And I, I always have to sort of just be straight with myself and just be like, no, just fucking, you don't perform without a guarantee, period. Yeah. And you, you're doing it because you're mm -hmm. fucking 45, you've been doing this for 20 years. And mm -hmm. also, the next time another artist comes along and yeah. they're, they ask for a guarantee, then that, that booker, that promoter, that talent buyer is going to say, well, yeah. that piece mm -hmm. of shit, Mishka hit us up for a guarantee yeah. i guess the i guess artists need to get paid for their work what a novel concept it's so weird it's so weird. yeah it's 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 really wild and it's there it is possible it's like i mean i was just up in portland uh doing shows for two weeks and like i was like cat sitting for kyle canane and doing shows in portland for two weeks it was a fucking uh, I delight love, i love canane so much my, my sweet my sweet my sweet man i love kyle so much and um I, I made like 900 bucks in like two weeks just doing showcase shows in Portland. And it was mm. like, oh, yeah, it's possible. Audiences will pay you if you fucking ask for them. Bars do have budgets they will give you. Like yeah. you just need to. It, it, there's such a scarcity mindset in comedy that is so pervasive. And like, I really wish more people that market themselves as free thinkers would like read 
about how like different societies could function and i'm just like man do you like or or like you know you got a lot of opinions on stage but you do not stand up for your shit off stage <laughs> damn just think about that live live your values yeah yeah <laughs> advocate for yourself and you'll also feel better at the end of the day it's like i know i'm an infinitely happier person because i don't compromise myself than a lot of people that are a lot more successful than me who that i you know will just be like "Ooh, you're not happy now because i yeah. can see it because i've seen you just walk up further and further away from the person that i used to know or whatever yeah yeah um brandy what uh give us your plugs what do you have coming up <laughs> the where can people find you the all that good stuff uh yeah i'm on twitter and instagram at brandazzle um i'm on tiktok at <laughs> brandazzle is here because somebody has brandazzle i don't fucking know i don't whatever follow me on the things it's fun i was thinking about starting a tiktok series where i watch a cult documentary and i find different food to barf up to it is that a tiktok brand is that a brand um <laughs> the new the new tiktok cooking trend throwing yeah God, it's so weird i saw a guy the other day that his whole thing was like reaching different pieces of different kinds of fast food with a little claw put them in, them in a blender and blending them up and then drinking it and i almost vomited and threw my phone across the room but he has a lot of millions of people watch it and i was like i don't need millions of people but if your listeners wanted to follow me uh <laughs> they probably would be my people it'd be fun um brandyposey.com is my website i also use bands in town um for all my tour dates so you can find me on there and lady to lady is my podcast uh, with barbara gray and tess barker two of my good friends we all started together and every week we have on a different guest it's usually another female comic just to like the idea of four women riffing it doesn't happen very often <laughs> um but we have dudes on from time to time which is fun and then um uh, i have a show in new york and la called picture this that is comedians paired up with animators who live animate your jokes during your set um Ooh, that, that sounds really, awesome it's really 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 fun i host the one in new york or in the one in la and samantha reddy hosts the one in new york um and uh it's it's a blast i've been doing that show for like 10 years and we've taken it to a bunch of cool different places and it's just it's it's my it's one of my favorite things to do it's just to see like oh that's what you thought i was saying okay cool like it's been an interesting thing to be like oh that's that is not the thing that i picture when i like say these words but that's it's inter it's been an interesting thing to be like oh that's what you that's what you thought i was saying okay got it so it's been a nice like exercise like, uh, for me too <laughs> but you can follow me on all the all the shit and uh and you guys are touring to altercation or you're touring back from altercation or uh, we're coming back from Fest, actually. From Fest, uh, okay. From Fest in right. Gainesville. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, uh, Anna is touring out. Hold on, where are my tour dates? Uh, she's touring out to Fest with John Michael Bond, and then I am meeting them there, and then coming back. Um, uh, so the weekend of Halloween is in Gainesville, and then we'll be in New Orleans, Austin, uh, potentially Houston, San Antonio. Uh, Albuquerque, uh, your house in Phoenix, which I'm excited about. And we're figuring out a couple more dates, but brandyposey.com has all got that info. So it'll be the end of October through uh, the first two weeks in November. Awesome. Yeah. Brandy, thank you so much for doing this. The I can't wait to have you guys uh, come and stay with me, meet my cat, meet my dog. And yeah. we, will, uh, we will talk endlessly about all the rest of this shit. Hell yeah. I'm excited to kick it in person. This will be fun. <laughs> awesome. All right. Good to meet you. You too. Have a good one. <laughs> Take care. Hey. Right. Folks, thank you so much for listening. I know there's uh, some million podcasts out there. We appreciate you uh, you spending your time with us. The um, If you're digging the show, if you're enjoying it, if, you, if these conversations uh, move you, make you laugh, annoy you, piss you off... Um, please take a minute to uh, to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, it helps us grow the show, and it helps other people find it. Um, if you'd like to hear bonus episodes, song demos, just sort of uh, ranting off the cuff uh, conversations, all sorts of different uh, bonus material, writing advice. Uh, personal blog posts and stuff like that. Uh, go to patreon.com slash Mishka Shabali. 
Uh, we will be having monthly episodes up there with my mom and I answering uh, questions from readers. And there's all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, thank you so much for supporting. <laughs>